And we are live. Welcome to uh, Isolation Podcast Edition 7. We are joined once again by uh, Simon Houston of Metabolic Movement. I think you're below me. So I got I'm this wrong side. Last time. You're to the side. Side. So let's, let's go that anyway, just in case. We're here. Okay. Um, and, then, and then Jack, who is either here or here, <laughs> um, from yeah. Soho Fitness London. Um, is that right, Jack? Yeah, yeah, no, no, but it's fine. Carry Not on. really. <laughs> <laughs> Fitness Lab. Great start. Fitness yeah. Lab London. Yeah, um, I knew this. I knew all this. I had it written down. And um, uh, today we're also joined by an old friend of mine, Sam Pullen from The Bridge, uh, Elico, uh, former Bath Rugby um, uh, employee. And um, we'll be talking about that. Hello, Sam. Welcome to the show. Hello. Good evening. How are you doing? Good morning, afternoon, whatever. Very well, thank you. Yes, not too bad. Excited for this. Yeah, good. That's good. Um, so I wouldn't I be the question. It's terrible. <laughs> listen, listen. Um, I have got a couple. Of, well, let, let's start with that because once again, Ben has asked us a question. And the question, like, seems to be the topic of every single one of these podcasts is, why is George bold? You know, yeah. So, guys, who wants to cover that one? Simon? Um, that one? <laughs> I think it's from your incredibly terrible attitude just for life in general like life. and Go and on. your and your lack of um contact with people you don't know do you want, would you feel free to elaborate for people well, <laughs> well, do you, do you hate everybody you don't know but you like the people you do know but um it's all that matters. you also you also uh, ruin children's parties <laughs> and, it wasn't a, it wasn't a part on that <laughs> it wasn't it was it it's like playing a, a game of ring a ring of rosies um but there's a two meter space and you were social distancing before it was cool. I was ahead of the curve. That's yeah. That's what I'm saying. So no, no, A, it wasn't a pie. It was Isla's gymnastics class. Oh, and I right, don't feel yeah. it's necessary to hold the hands with someone I don't know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> this is a, sure. that's a, you know, so it's, um, yes. So um, let me just introduce Sam properly, everybody. Um, so um, I'd like to start by um, <coughs> saying how I first met Sam. We were in school. Sam was in the year below me, um, and Mr. Darch, our legendary teacher, um, decided to put Sam into our rugby team, which was cool until I realised it was my position that he was taking. <laughs> um, and then, and then, and then um, hey, I Sam, stood at the side, yeah, and I, was, and I was like, shit, man, I want to play that position. So they put me on the wing because obviously I'm rapid, um, but I still wanted to play my position. The minute, obviously, I saw Sam play two minutes of the game and then immediately was like, no, no, this is the right choice to put him <laughs> there instead of me. So the first, the first time I encountered Sam was, um, he basically took my, my place in the rugby team. Um, but um, St. Greg's, St. Greg's massive, Mr. Darch, anyone who knows him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, he is, isn't he? He is, he's just, did he ever, do... Sam, sorry guys, uh, me and Sam just, yeah. Um, did he we'll ever leave. like, we um, he used to get, he used to go into the, if ever you played front row for, you know, like a PE or something, and if he was playing front row opposite you, obviously we had baby soft skin at the time because we were kids, and he'd rub his bristly beard yeah. on your yeah, cheeks. Do you remember he, yeah, he, yeah, he was brutal, mate. He, he, he would tell you if you were in the front row, like if you, if you were to pay, um, I can't remember what, what rugby it was now, but if you just played a three front row, you'd, he'd be telling you to get your back of your head up and towards the middle of their chest. Yeah, if yeah, lift them up. Grab their little finger and yank the crap out of it. Honestly, he was absolutely brutal. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was old school. He used to, the, used to t- yeah, oh, it, the tricer. Oh, mate, he was. He was brutal. And the thing is, he actually made us play. It would be totally illegal now. It's in the gymnasium. He made us play proper rugby. Um, yeah, <laughs> full contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah full, full contact. And you know, on the side where you've got, you know, your little climbing frame. I was picking people up and shoving them in. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a, Do you remember Adam Box? I shouldn't name drop really. If you remember Boxy in my year, Adam. Oh uh, yeah, 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 a little blonde yeah. chap. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, he was chatting once in PE, and Darchy, as we called him, warned him. He was all like, "Oh, stop talking, or the ball's getting thrown at your head." And we thought, mm-hmm. "No." He carried on talking, launches this basketball directly in Adam's face. <laughs> oh. Honestly, it's just fair play to Adam though. He just sat there and he was just like. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> that, that is how peace should be delivered these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. It wouldn't be. Imagine now. Imagine now. What would happen to to a teacher? Oh would, yeah, you'd be back. Yeah, you'd be banged up. You'd be. Um, we used to have teachers chasing like just kids out of school, kicking them off the street, and just <laughs> yeah. nobody nobody said anything. 
No, really, I mean? didn't he? Mm. For a, mostly because the kids were doing stuff that they shouldn't have been doing, so they just didn't. But like nobody said a word. Yeah, man, I would never have been able to go home and been like to my mum. I was like, I feel like I was treated unfairly. My mum would have yeah. been like, "But what, what did, did you, you wrong? do? Because yeah. <laughs> you're a terrible little boy." You know, <laughs> just does this. You know, she still says that to me now. To be fair. Mm. Um. Anyway, this is a fit- <laughs> this is this is a fitness podcast, so we should we should get on. Oh, yeah. Um. Oh, well, Sorry, guys. Uh, I do digress quite a lot. Um, so, Sam, um, like with all the guests that come on, I just want you to st- um, tell the guys about yourself, um, just a little bit about your history in in the fitness in the fitness world, bit of sport, and if you could tell us about um, how you guys are going at the at the bridge, um, what you're what you're generally up to, and what you're up to now. Um, let's start with that, and then I'll ask you something else later. Otherwise, I'm asking you to. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, uh, so my name's Sam, 32. I work at the CrossFit. And the bridge in Trowbridge. I've been in the industry properly, probably for about a solid five years. I did start 10 plus ish years ago, but then I was in a commercial gym. I, I came out of it um, after a few years. I didn't really kind of like the commercial side of things. And then um, I went to another job. I started doing CrossFit on the side a little bit. I was thinking I was all quite fit and I started and I was like, I can't even do a burpee without nearly being sick everywhere. And for some reason, at that time, I was like, do you know what? I need more of this in my life. So then I kept coming back, kept coming back. And um, yeah, just the guys and en- eventually ended up saying, you know, if we ever opened up another place, would you, would you be interested in, in running it with us? And I was like, when are you doing this tomorrow? Next, mm-hmm. uh, next week. <laughs> so um, actually, I, it actually took over a year. So it was the longest, I don't know, call it yeah, the longest interview, I suppose, because then I helped out on a little <laughs> intro quiz and um, kind of just made, I made a good rapport with the guys a lot. And uh, yeah, I had, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I played when I was younger, I played a lot of rugby, played a lot of football, played everything. But yeah, I've really kind of just narrowed down into more like the CrossFit functional fitness type. I know functional gets thrown around left, right and centre. But I just kind of, I like the sport of CrossFit, but also I like how it can help modern day people, average Joes, just move a little bit better over time. I think with CrossFit, sometimes it gets slammed with a bad name because people can do what they want to do. But there's also other people that within the industry um, that can actually help a lot of people. So yeah, sorry. I a little bit. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Um, so tell us about the, the bridge, Sam. How's it? Well, I mean, pre lockdown, um, how are you guys going? What sort of stuff? Is it just the daily wads you offer clients, or do you do PT on this and or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do PT, so that's very individual to the coaches there. But yeah, really much our bread and butter is classes. So we have classes at seven, we have three classes in the oh, sorry, two classes in the morning, four to three to four classes in the evening depends on different days and then they can vary we have themes of the day so it might be a hinge and a single leg movement it might be a push and a pull it might be whatever but we have we have all the ded- dedicated areas within the gym so more cells and um, trying to get more members into the gym we've got a guy that does the programming we've got another guy that kind of oversees everything but yeah we do pt alongside that as well so if anybody's struggling with more weightlifting and they want to be better at that because they realized in a class that they couldn't yeah, it just, just wasn't quite working. I suppose as a coach, if you're in front of a class of 15, 20 people, it's very hard to be very detailed with everybody all in one hit. So then some people do come to you and say, I want a little bit more work on X, Y, and Z. And then, yeah, you know, take them out of the class. We can work with them on a one-to-one basis. They can still come and do classes as, as they wish, but just gives them something to focus. Usually get quite a lot of people come and say, I want to do a pull-up. Okay, well, how much time have you got? I've got none. But when do you want to buy? <laughs> it's not going to happen, is it? So it's a lot of realisation for that sometimes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but, so, but otherwise, yeah, we, we were going well. We were going well before this um, lockdown stuff happened. So, yeah. Are you running your classes now as well? Like, I've, I've noticed a couple of things on your social media, but have, have you guys been running classes online and stuff yeah. like we're all doing? Yeah, yeah, very much what we're doing now on Zoom. Um, and, you know, fair play to, you know, I know totally everyone's in a bit of a different situation of money and all that sort of stuff. We've got very much loyal members at the moment. So we are trying to provide them with as much stuff as we can. We've got a cooking class that we do on a uh, Tuesday night with uh, one of our coaches, Fen from Bath. Um, I do a mobility sessions on Sunday for the guys at which I'm recording and then trying to put out to them so they can do it on more than one occasion if they wish to. Uh, and then yeah, obviously our classes alongside that. And obviously we've been very, seen some of the videos you've been doing George as well, with like the band and kettlebells and dumbbells and we're doing much something very similar. So, we're, uh, we're trying to give as much as we can. If we gave one product, I don't know, it's just people, people won't be very much interested. So we do like a quiz night. We try and keep people engaged through our tribes That's and good. stuff like that. So yeah, we're, we're trying to give as much as we can. Because obviously it's quite a lot of people, I think they have the mentality of, I pay this money and I must go to the gym. However, I'm paying this money and I'm still at home. So uh, I think <laughs> just 
<laughs> we're trying to give them as much as we can. So yeah, you know, and everyone is being very loyal as much as we can. We're not, fingers crossed, if it goes as they say, it's going to go in the lockdown, we should be able to recover. It might take a long time thereafter, but we should have enough to kind of start both gyms back up anyway. On a, on a random note there, but like CrossFit seem to have done one of, the, like the best thing I've seen out of CrossFit is that member like community. It seems they, they, mm. they'd be created by CrossFit. Everybody seems to get to know each other. Everybody gets involved and then everybody keeps each other motivated and keep and, and going all the time. And you, everybody does. We, don't, we used to do classes in our last gym and other places do classes, but none seems to have the same group mentality and community that CrossFit seems to have, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I... I suppose I don't really know any different other than when I was at a commercial gym many years ago, but anyone who comes through the door, they're very much, they're very nervous. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not fit enough. And the question always asks, ask, well, what's fit enough? And then they go, well, yeah. I don't know. Cool. So uh, we've had, we've got people ranging from 18. We've got people ranging up to sort of 50, 60 plus people. And it's very, very uh, exciting to see when the older population come in and they think they can't do it and everything can be regressed. And yeah. they are, said about the community side of things I, I try to make sure as clear as crystal make it as crystal clear as I can is that no one has any ego in this place whatsoever you have come in to here with your own reasons and wanting to start your fitness journey or change your fitness journey but there is no ego statistical people if there is anybody in here and they feel like that they, they can treat other people in a bad way due to whatever reason there's a lovely set of double doors I got that they yeah. can lead so yeah. yeah we do try to make much um, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what ability you are, everyone is able to do supposedly you know, CrossFit, so to speak. Mm. That's cool, man. Um, so, um, oh, by the way, everyone, before I go on, um, yes, that is Jack behind me, just so you know. So mm. That's how you got out of the shower this that's morning. That's how you got out of the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast time. Hold on, does it look like I've got, does it now look like I've got, oh my yes. God, is that Hugh Jackman? Know, yeah. Yes. Hold on, yeah. hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> There he is. Spike. Spike. We all know I haven't got enough hair for that these days. So yeah. those days are behind me. Um, Sam, tell us a little bit about um, about your competition. I know you and I have, have discussed it um, privately because we're old friends. Um, tell us a little bit about your competing. Um, what I want to know is, is um, you have your, your, I know you guys have your wads and stuff like that that you do daily. Would your, would your, um, training for competition just follow the general wad or would you do your own thing or a bit of both yeah me personally I, yeah, it's a bit of a combination of, of stuff sometimes it's I know people like to, to program for themselves but sometimes I just like to, to see what I've got I'm going straight in and, and I can do it in the past I've had my colleague my mate Shax he's um he's done programming for me as well but the classes are they the classes are very tough and they, they can be then we have recommendations for weights because we've got Again, like I was talking about different scales of people. We've got people that have been with us for five years and in the other gym, like up to 10 years. We've got people that have been with us for a couple of months. So, and it really depends. But I mean, in terms of competition, yeah, there's going to be things that you're going to need to try to, to build on, especially when you go through phases of training and, and you're then going to have to start to peak before competition. Because if you just start staying in an accumulation phase and then go to competition and you haven't really built up any anaerobic type, type stuff, it's going to be... It's going to be quite hard to be able to compete through that. And depending on what the comp competition is, is it going to be one day? Is it going to be two days? Um, so, yeah. So, um, sorry, I've totally kind of veered off a little bit on your question. <laughs> so, like, uh, the question was kind of, would you do your own training um, or the yeah. one, or just a mixture of the two, basically? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, it, it would be a combination of the two. But, yeah, there's, there's certain things I would, I would work on. If I know in a competition, there's going to be a lot of gymnastic work. Is it going to be a lot of weightlifting? Then, yeah, I'll be... I'll be playing around with certain things within um, within my training sessions, yeah, over the week. Months. Tell me, yeah. tell me How this. many times a week would you train when you're building up to a competition? Uh, it's different now. If you'd have asked me five years ago, I would have done 14 hours worth of training. So I would have done always an AM session. I would have always done then a PM session. I would have had two um, rest days throughout that as well. So what's that? Two? Well, it's maybe 12 hours in a week. Um, yeah, that's. I would usually do a light session in the morning, and then in the afternoon it would be well, whatever, whatever program yeah. to be. So what would a light now, session now, now, No, sorry, carry sorry. on. No, uh, but where, whereas, now, whereas nowadays, it's, that was back then, sort of, you know, 25 years old, 26, 27, I was kind of like, you know, competition, competition, competition. I've got to be fit, fit, fit. And then actually kind of like when you start 
getting a little bit older, like I said, 32 now, it's kind of like, you know, do I really need to smash myself into the ground every day? Do I, do I really need to, what am I, who am I trying to kid here? What do I, all I want to do is kind of now live until I'm 60, 70, 80 years old and still fingers crossed walk on my hands without breaking my bones. Like, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> match and, and, and feel just confident. And I suppose my mentality has very much changed in that as well. Like I don't, I'm very much saying about, I think you said about what's my training sessions look like now. A combination between like hypertrophy work, I do a lot of sustainable aerobic work. I might chuck in a few speed power work here and there. But um, again, all I'm doing now in my training sessions is just playing around with stuff. I have I had one competition coming up, but I think due to a lockdown, it's going to not happen now. But my competition days, I wouldn't say necessarily are over. But I always want to be in a position of combination of like health. But also then if I wanted to do something local, then I can you know, it take very long to get back into the mix. So. Really? Tell, me this, um, tell me this, do you when you have competitions, because I never ever like find this out, if you have competitions, do they tell you in advance what is going to be on the competition? Some of them do. Um, some of them do, some of them don't. And it depends on how higher up the competitions you want to go. Like We've got my, my boss slash mate, Ollie Mansbridge, who runs sanctional event Strength and Depth in London, which had just happened um, this year and last year. Um, and yeah, none of them really cut up. I think they don't really get told until the day before. So unless that's hard. Three. So, you know, you, you are literally, and I suppose CrossFit is very much you prepare for the unknown. Yeah. Um, Constant movements done at high intensity. It's very much you're trying to guess. And then I think there was one regionals that there was, n no one really does bench press. I say no one really does any bench press, but you'll see the CrossFitters doing all the runner themselves around the rig and overhead squats and all that sort of stuff. And then there was a workout that had loads of bench press in it. People were like, Crap. what? <laughs> uh, <exactly. laughs> the last time I did bench press so it's um you know again I suppose from a coaching element that's um that's where you could be very creative in terms of what you do but yeah cool um so um how many comps did you do Sam just to remind me did you do you know off the top of your head or was it just quite so many that you well, don't remember yeah yeah well I mean we're over a seven year period but I've done quite a few the, the biggest one I did was well, when CrossFit had regionals and back in 2015, that was, um, that's for me, that was my highlight in a, a CrossFit setting. And that was when we went to Copenhagen, we went to the, uh, a dome of some sort and there was a you know, massive rig, there was big stadium people around, there was ca cameras and all that sort of stuff. And that was, that was quite, I thought, was, was the highlight of the pinnacle for me. I mean, next stage of that would have been games, but I mean, for me personally, that would have been a bit too hard. And I think people don't realise to, to go from what was open to regionals is bloody hard work let alone then going from the next stage because I think this, the top five teams or individuals then go to the next and then, you know, you're, you're talking the best of the best in the world and they're all just mentally insane. <laughs> yeah. What would you... Really, in a nutshell. Sam, when you were training, when you were in the competition time, like you said you did it for seven years and you were training twice, twice a day? Twice. Yeah, yeah. How would you eat for that? Everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, for the nutritional side of things, I suppose it's... I mean, you can get very much down into the root of measuring everything out. And I got down to the point of where I was measuring butter on my bit of toast. And I was like, well, how much does that weigh? Okay, how much calories does that give me? And at some point I was just thinking, oh, this is really hard. You know, I'm not really getting paid for this in any way, shape or form. But I, would, I would just make sure I don't have a diet, so to speak. I would just have good food. I mean, I know the difference between if I feel like I'm going to have a cheesecake and loads of chocolate and have croissants before I train, Clearly, that's all going to end up on the floor or somewhere on the wall or down a drain. But then, if I'm making, I can prepare myself in terms of right. Okay, I'm going to, I've got a real easy-ish session today. You know, I can I can have something quite nourishing uh, an hour or so before I train. I just make sure that I try and think of it as like a process. I I eat wholesome foods beforehand, enough time for it to digest. I do my workout, and within there, I just make sure I don't know I might have a banana of some sort, or I just make sure I keep my liquids up, and then I make sure I eat. A certain amount of food or whatever at the very end so at some point I did start measuring everything but then I got it's just too much of a big job so I was just like right just eat when you're hungry but just make sure the majority of your food 80 plus percent is going to be pretty decent yeah. basically that show you, you can go down the rabbit hole of nutrition and mega 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 but just keep it simple really I wouldn't and I'm, sorry go on no no you carry on carry on so like towards up, up to competition, you know, I think when people also, they, they go for like running like a marathon, so I've got to load up on carbs, load up on carbs. I mean, yeah, like, you know, it's cool. That's going to kind of trick, make, might trickle through into the next day. But I was just thinking, why am I going to eat any different between, before a competition? I'll eat massively different if it's a two-day competition. I'm pretty much going to be living on carbs and sugars. But 
prior to that, I'm not going to overeat or in any way, shape or form. I just try to keep eating good foods throughout. It was just, I was going on what Jack was saying the other week, weren't you saying one of the <clears throat> top CrossFit guys is eating just uh, tubs of the Ben and Jerry's just to get the calories in at the end of the day? Yeah, exactly. That was going to be my next point. So there's like, I think one of the, like speaking from the outside, I've only done a bit of it, but not to the extent that you've done. But there's like the difference between competition CrossFit, like you've done, and then general going to a class CrossFit. And people, I think, yeah. mix up the two because this end with the competition, people see that and think that's what it is and that's what you have mm. to do, whereas it's not. So you could say, you could argue this isn't healthy. Like, what they do yeah, exactly. long term exactly what you said you've had to change because long term it's not going to work so yeah yeah you exactly that so, you know, documentaries eating like thousands of calories and they're like oh i can do that when i'm doing like three mm. and it's like no no it's different <laughs> exactly yeah now you've, you've got crossfit the sport you've got crossfit for health and longevity you know you've you're not going to have 60 year old doris coming in and smashing themselves in a competition yeah. because <laughs> they're the rest of their life to recover whereas yeah. you have 60 year old doris that you know, rather than doing an overhead squat, so to speak, because that can be quite a complicated movement, she might just do a squat down to a box with her arms above her head and stand back up. And that for her could be absolutely perfect. So, you know, how are you trying to make sure you can get up a set of stairs because the escalators aren't working or the elevator isn't working or, you know, you want to run around with your grandkid or your kid or whatever, you know, lunges are going to help you walk up those stairs, deadlifting for whatever reason is going to help you pick up your child, you know, and it's not about how much you can lift, it's just how well you can move. It's really it. I love how all 60-year-olds are called Doris as well. We all, we all <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> just... yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jack, go on, mate. Sorry. Yeah, a question off that, because as a coach in CrossFit, how do you sort of deal with people who see CrossFit and people see dying on the floor when they watch on TV and stuff? And so I assume they have an expectation when they go to classes. That's what it needs to be like. So how, like yeah. I mean, even for myself, like not in CrossFit, people think they have to be dying at the end of the session to feel like they've worked i can only imagine it's even more so in crossfit so how do you deal with that we are not necessarily put them down but you know some people say i've got to come in i've got to get absolutely sweaty and i've got to crawl out okay great but then i try i try my best to say you have to realize that that isn't good you're always trying to put yourself in the red zone being constantly in the red zone all the time at some point you're going to crash and burn and i say would you run at that wall for 60 minutes every day for a week for a month yeah, because at some point you're going to go, do you know what, I don't need to hit that wall anymore because it hurts. So mm -hmm. it's, we, we, we should, I do try to make sure that we try and, we try and give people, you know, an RPE scale is probably pretty very basic, but some, a lot of our members have heart rate monitors as well. So we do try to say to them, try to keep your heart rate within between 120, 140, no more than 160. Like if you feel like you can't hold a conversation, then slow the pace down. So we try our best to say, for those that are quite confident in doing the hard stuff, they, you know, they're more than willing to go and do it. But we also do program over the week as well. Like we might do something quite tough at the start of the week, but then throughout the week it would become a little bit less. So they have no choice but to do it. But we do reiterate, you know, let's say on a Friday, we've got a nice long 30, 40 minute aerobic work, but guys, you know, you've had a real hard week. Treat this as, um, as a bit of a recovery. And some people actually quite relish the moment of like, oh, yeah, thank God, I haven't really got to work that hard, but I can still feel a little bit good. I can get a bit sweaty and, you know, and still leave with a smile on their face rather than crawling out. So we do try our best to educate. Yes, you get the old person now and again that says, I just need to slam myself to the ground. Great, go and sort yourself out. But don't come to me when you start got an injuries and stuff like that because I'm going to say, I told you so. We're all adults here. You know, we, I don't, if you want to go and smash yourself down on the ground, feel free. But I'm going to tell you to stop doing it. If you don't want to listen to me, then that's entirely up to you. But... Uh on that, on that, with with your own clients, Simon, uh, Simon, sorry, um, yeah. Sam. When it comes to, <laughs> you're in a different room. Oh yeah, I'm in a different room. Transportation. I did see Georgie just creep into the shot. Is that why you moved? She's going to be in there now, cooking and banging around. Just. No, <laughs> okay. So I just looked around. I was just like, "What?" Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sam. With with your own clients, yeah. your one-on-ones, um, are most of them kind of like you said earlier come to see you because they want to get better at some of the moves within the classes or do you have fat loss generally or what's the main kind of demographic or does it vary uh, really a lot yeah yeah it varies there's, there's some people that want to get better at crossfit so to speak and then i'm okay okay well, well what do you have and oh, oh i want to do a competition next year okay okay well where are you what have you done previously well i haven't really done anything or i want so uh, you know you can get people that want to get better at certain areas but yeah and that, 
fat loss, not necessarily. People just want to be able to move better. I suppose if we if we sit down and discuss like what sort of foods, what behaviours, what's your understanding about food, um, we we do kind of discuss a little bit about that. And I suppose a little byproduct from it, without going too much down a rabbit hole on the nutrition side, is that you know if as long as you come here, as long as you you know you'll see me two three times a week, and um, then you know a bit of a byproduct of that is is you should lose a little bit of weight. Now there's nothing we can do as coaches when they're outside of here. If they go and eat that cheesecake after because they think that's great recovery food, you know, we can only do the best we can. But um it, it, it does vary in terms of clientele. I've got one person that's had like four strokes and he can't move his arm. And so, you know, there's I have to be extremely creative in terms of giving him stuff to do. He's never going to be able to build muscle massively because of the symptoms he's got, but he's very much going to be able to try to somewhat maintain working with physios and osteopaths around that that he should just be able to be a little bit better at life. That's, that's really it. So yeah, it very much varies. Yeah, very, yeah, but that's, yeah, that sounds good. Um, is there any more questions about the CrossFit um, for Sam, guys? You got anything else? Because I want to move on to some of well, the other stuff that Sam's... Just going on there, just a random one. Because like, CrossFit, uh, when it started, got a really bad rap um, for injury rates and all that sort of thing. And what do you put that down to? Do you put that down to people training too hard, going too hard because of the way CrossFit is, is designed? Or do you put that down to bad programming at the early stages? Uh, I think it was going on what Jack said about, you know, people expect it to be like real high, um, you know, what work the highest we can, be in the red zone, smash, 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 because that's the best thing we can do. I wasn't really around when it all started, but the guys who were in the gyms, they were very much like that. The day before a competition, they would do the hardest work that they can because they needed to be ready for it. And actually what they did do was going into competitions, they were actually starting in such a shit position that you know, they didn't do extremely well. But, so that's probably the reason why, is that they were just working at such a high rate for such a long period of time because you just have to smash, smash, smash. And that's probably where you're going to get nine times out of ten your injuries from. So that's my only assumption by that yeah. question. Yeah, I think that's good. I think I think it's good to hear hear that, and for people to hear that, and um, kind of trying to display a myth, as it were, that if you know, as long as we've got good coaches in there, who's got the best the client's best interest at heart, then um, then it, it, it will work out for anyone. And that separation, that's a really good point. The separation between competition and um, and general CrossFit is is should be seen as two very different things. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> Sam, do you mind telling us a little bit about? Um, uh, I think the um, viewers would like to hear about your time at Bath Rugby. Uh, uh, what sort of stuff yeah, did so you do? Who, what did you, who did you work with, ETC? Uh, um, so what did I do? How did I go about it? Uh, the 2018-2019 season, prior to their pre-season, I knew somebody who knew the head strength and conditioning coach. And I basically I sent an email to them about because I'd just done all my mobility stuff and I was like, oh, do you know, I actually think this could be really good for the players. I reckon it'd be good between the... Uh, their training sessions, I think it'd be good, uh, like gym sessions, their training sessions on the pitch, and just sort of ju pure general health. So I was just like, you know, I, I fired an email to it. I didn't hear anything for a long time. And the guy came in and said, actually, do you know what? That sounds really good because I'm actually trying to see if I can outsource all of this information for my own, for my own um, strength and conditioning guys. And he was like, do you know what? Fancy, you fancy coming in? So I spoke to him, uh, then went for four free, um, four free mobility sessions for the players in their preseason which making six foot guys you know over 100 kilos squeal without even touching them is actually a pretty decent uh, pretty decent <laughs> skill to have so um yeah it kind of went down that rabbit hole a little bit really and it all seemed to go well the head strength condition guy really liked it they actually started filming some of my stuff whether to rob it or not i don't know but they i carried them throughout the first six months of the season just coming in once or twice a week with the players every time some of them see me they're like oh god not you again <laughs> and i was just like right well, you get paid some decent, you get some paid some decent money, <laughs> sit on your ass, just let me do what I've got to do. So, um, and then towards the Christmas time, actually, um, of 2000, towards the end of 2018, uh, one of the strength condition guys actually left and he said, you know, do you fancy coming on for the next six months versus a self-employed basis? So I was like, yeah, got it. So and through that, I basically managed to do a little bit more mobility sessions with the guys that was quite good. I managed to get some of, get to know some of them on a personal basis. I helped out with the current strength and conditioning programs that they were going so the head guy would pretty much write everything and we would just facilitate however some of the guys as they were going down they got injured I was helping some of them out there was one guy that also looked after the injured guys um, and then yeah I kind of introduced a little bit of CrossFit to them because towards the end of the season they just sort of mentally start to 
just mentally start to kind of wear off, wean off a little bit. So I was just like, all right, well, I'll give them something a little bit different. So they seemed to like it. It was quite hard for them. So I think they do like a little challenge now and again. But overall, it was, was quite an exciting experience, really. It was good. Any gossip? Any gossip? Any, any things that you're, <laughs> you're not so pay? No. Is that, is that, is, is that, that a no? Is that a no? Next no. question. <laughs> Next question. Um, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that another time. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on that, so you got into Bath... Um, you had your time at Bath Rugby that came off the back of um, your brand own your range. <clears throat> Would you mind yeah. telling us all a little bit about that and um, yeah, I'd, sort of stuff that enough. you do with people and, and all that? Yeah, so I, I was very intrigued to think uh, when we all, when I first started out, say five years ago, it's like, you know, you just, you just, I'm not going to say you just expect, but you have the, many people have the idea that, you know, well, people should be able to do this and people should be able to do that. I mean, I wasn't quite that naive about it, but it was like, you know, there's a deeper level than just trying to say, there's a deeper level of like joint function. People need to be, able to be in a position that they can have a functional joint to be able to do X, Y, and Z. So there was a, a guy that's called Dr. Andrew Spina who does functional anatomy seminars in and around the world, which I got introduced to by my, my mate Shax. And um, I kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit of everything that they were doing. The first bit of it is more functional range release, which is more massage and stuff like that, which isn't really in my bag. But then it starts going down more of like functional range conditioning. So ranges of movement, not necessarily what's good, but what is, is good for that individual. And I suppose that if somebody ever asks about like, you know, what's a good range of movement, it depends. What's this looking, looking to have um, and needing. And then I just, there was four of them that I did and that was, took me over about a year and a half, two years to do. And then that kind of led me in a little bit to the bath rugby side of things. And I was just sat on the row and I spoke to my, my mate Ollie and I was like, I don't really know what to call it. Like, if I'm going to do all this sort of stuff, I feel like I need a bit of a brand name of some sort. And I was just sat there and I just come out with like, well, how about own your range? Like, you should own every part of the range of movement you should have. And that's kind of like where it started with, really. I mean, if I'm honest, I haven't really gone very, it hasn't gone very big at all. I've just used that for myself. But um, that's what I trade under, really, is, is, is own your range. So yeah, I just, I just try to use it. I, I link, I'd say, link onto my like Instagram page. People don't want to do the boring stuff they want to do the, the the big fancy yeah i just want to smash myself down to the ground and do all that sort of stuff. i was like well hang on you have the prerequisites to be able to do what you're asked what you want to do oh no i don't need it okay well, well carry on then because you'll injure yourself oh no, no, no oh i've got this injury well what did i tell you so i think people want to do the fancy stuff they can run before they can walk so yeah sorry digress again so um so um tell me this sam like what what sort of stuff is it? Is it mainly stretching? Is it movement? Is there any strength involved with it? Or is it a mixture of, of, of all of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be very much isometric movements, but it's, it, it, it's a combination of like, uh, it's a combination of stretching and then like isometric loading within that. There's different ways, there's like acronyms of like pales and rails, so progressive and regressive uh, angular isometric loading. We have hovers, we have passive range liftoffs. And all it is is just within and around a joint, you are trying to challenge the nervous system in many different ways. So there, there's, there's a system, there's a process going through. So what's, do these people have sufficient or insufficient ranges of movement? Um, is, it, is there more of a physical restriction or is it more of a neurological restriction? And then if it's more of a neurological restriction, it allows you to kind of, as a coach, work on more of the hardware. If you work on the hardware, the software, i.e. the central nervous system will, fingers crossed, allow it to, what the central nervous system should be able to just work with the hardware that it's got so yeah there's many different acronyms but yeah you can just challenge the nervous system as best you can it just um, looks what? painful looking at it from the outside because i've seen stuff where you have on instagram and i've seen where people are doing it because it's become quite popular across the world i find like finding this end range and like you said trying to control the joint right when it's on its limited capacity of movement and it looks tough man you see people squealing like you said you have bath rugby players struggling with it just to lift yeah, exactly. it off the ground yeah exactly but then I suppose all you're trying to do then is just work with the best of that of that person's individual ability you know you know I'm not asking if if one player can stick his arm hand up his, his leg up by his head but the other person can't then it's absolutely that's absolutely fine for them it's very um it's very sport specific but then if you go into more general pop all I want to be able to do is like I said I want to get to my 78 years old and I can still put my arm above my head I can still pick something I can still squat I can all I'm trying to do is to uh, we were all born I mean so we've got kids, I know George got kids, but when the kids are born, they sit into the bottom of squat like it's absolutely nothing. We all have the ability to be able to do that. What we do throughout life is obviously then changed so then we can't do it. So if people are sat at a desk or they're sat at a range of movement that they're very good at, as soon as they go to a point of 
running out the way of a car or if they just wanted to try a new skill, a new sport, but they thought, oh yeah, you know, 20 years ago I was pretty good, but now I'm like, no, I can't do it. And all of a sudden they pull something. I suppose what we're trying to do is give yourself the ability to be ready-ish for whatever may happen, whether it be day-to-day -day life, whether it be start a new sport, you know, that's really kind of, that's my mentality behind it as well. Mm. Um, could you just, uh, going back to um, the difference between whether it's neurological or not, how would you determine that? Um, would you assess, how would you assess someone's, someone's joint, for example? Uh, so, we were then kind of going like closing angle pain. So, for example, if I'm trying to go up to here, if, if I was, if this was as far as I can only take my arm up, and then I can take it out round to the side, like right? what, what, what's going on there? If I can, if I can raise it up, and then I get that my client to hold, and I get them to hold here, and I do like a passive range or a, a contraction, relaxation sort of thing, if they're able to kind of move a little bit, you can only you can only lie to the central nervous system a few times. But if they're able to gain a little bit of range of movement, you're probably going to be able to work. The soft tissue a little bit and that's where the neurological side of it's going to happen however if they start coming up and you start getting a pain in that shoulder then i'd be like okay well you need to go and see a physio or something like that to see if there's any sort of actual pinch and why is there a pinch and then i suppose we're we're we're, we're of the we're more of the workman whereas I, you know i can't we none of us can die unless some of you can i don't know but i can't diagnose what and what what issue there is so if they go to the medical professional and they come back to me then if i know that there's an impingement of some sort i know that we only have to work within this range and then just over time, we, we create a stronger movement, rotation, whatever you want to, whatever you want to do for that climb. And then you just kind of back and forth and then you go through that way. So for me, if they're able to gain a range of movement pain free, I'd say that's more neurological. If they're starting to go through and it's more pain, get it looked yeah. at. So we know then as coaches what we can work with going yeah. forward. I think that's a smart idea as well, though, just by knowing what you're good at and what your strengths are rather than trying to just be a jack of all trades with that and just yeah. be like, oh, well, I think I know what that pain is. You know, I know the muscle structure in the shoulder and I suppose I could just uh, do X, Y and Z. Instead, you're just going, I'm going to send you to somebody who knows exactly what they're doing. And then when they relay that information back, I can work with that. That's I like that. Yeah, I just, I just don't understand how you've got so many people to think, like you said, jack of all trades. If you don't know, you don't know. Don't yeah. stand there and embarrass you in front of your client. Yeah. And just because you've got a chart up there that says, well, if I push that shoulder there, his, his middle toe is going to flicker. <laughs> <laughs> just send it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point, I think. Um, Sam, um, how many of your clients do you do this with? Do you do it with, with everyone? Is there a class within the, the CrossFit that you, that you do it in? Or is, is it just one-on-one -on -one uh, basis at the moment? And a little bit of both. I, I, I do it with my clients, depending on what that individual wants. If they do need uh, ranges of movement, increase, decrease, whatever. You know, it's, it really depends. But um, I might put it at the start of their session. Like for the guy I was saying who's had the four strokes. Like we just try to make sure that we move through his best range of movement as much as possible. I always put that at the very start. Um, with the classes as well, I do that very much within, we do a general warm-up, specific warm-up, and I give very much mobility stuff prior to the sessions as well. Um, and then, yeah, I have done in the past, I've done classes for guys at the gym, of which I'm doing for now on a Zoom um, basis on Sundays at 10 a.m., which gents are all very welcome, by the way, and any viewers listening, very welcome. I will, uh, I'll put the link on my Instagram account, um, for a zoom so you're more than welcome to jump in on sunday 10 a.m oh. bright and early see you there yeah, um, <laughs> we're up and, early um, anyway <laughs> uh, yeah um so yeah i i, I, I check it in, in in anywhere i possibly can if it's helpful for those people or that individual or for whatever we're doing on the workout uh, what what generally have you seen like uh, any pattern so it's, it's um is there a joint for example that you have to work on the most on people so, for example knee shoulder hip or Hips and lower back really is where people are. Hips and lower back. Um, some people, yeah, they, they want to try and do a, a push press, a strict press standing up, but all they've got is this much flexion of the shoulder and all of a sudden then they put so much tension in the back and lower back because that's the only way they can compensate to get whatever object of the yeah. And then all of a sudden they're going, oh yeah, well, I don't really feel it on my shoulders, but my back is in absolute yeah. agony. <laughs> <laughs> Because you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, and then even things like that. If I, if when in the class we do a part A, so we, we do a strict press um, as a strength part element to the workouts, we we adapt. You know, we might do a landmine press. We might get the guys to some of the guys to do a an incline press. Might get them to do a floor press or something. Just because it's there doesn't mean that you have to do it. Mm. Yeah, so you offer adaptations to, to the exercises yeah. that if they can exactly, be done, that's, and, and, yeah, and that's great. I mean, and the things I've heard a story in um, where Shax is 
is they went to America and his wife his wife has no ankle. She lives a, she lives in heels all day long. And the only coaching element uh, that it came down to was shouting at her, get lower in that squat. Mm, yeah. what do you want to do? You know what I mean, it's just, it baffles me. So I think that's when sometimes CrossFit can get a bit of a bad name. So did yeah, but you that's, go just and... like, that's just a bad coach, though, isn't it? There's bad PTs out there, you know? Exactly, but if, no, if nobody's ever been to any other CrossFit gym, so to speak, they go to there and all of a sudden this guy's yell, 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 yell. Then that yeah. brands everybody else, which I find is a little yeah. bit unfortunate. It's the way of the game. Sam, what so, would the process be if someone, so someone came to you and was like, I want to improve my range of movement in whatever joint or overall, you said there was like steps with the pails and rails. What's like level one? Where do you start someone? What's the first thing they do? What do they progress to? Um, let me just get it here. So yeah, we would progress, like you go from like insufficient passive ranges of movement. So if a, we always get them to, there's always an assessment and we go for assessment for e each of the joints. But for example, if I stick to the shoulders, just easy so I can show, is that we act, like, passively try to force them up and see how far they can go and then I'll actively get them to do it. You're never going to be able to get more active ranges of movement beyond a passive range of movement. It's going to be pretty freakish. But if you're able to raise the arm up and they can get within around about 80% of it, then that's absolutely fine. If, you're, if you go passive range of movement, but they've only got like 20% range of movement, you're thinking, okay, we need to increase that a little bit. And then it goes through their yeah, pails and rails. You can do it at different levels. So I can, I can just whack my arm around and that's going to be pretty much a level one. However, if I can take a deep breath, I'm going to uh, hold the rest of my body and I'm going to raise this up as much as I can. I could even add an additional weight if I want. And that's going to be classed as more of a level three. All we're trying to do is make it go from a simple movement to a more harder movement. And, you know, there's no right or wrong on that. It's just you could probably cue your clients to say, I want you to be working at 10% in this one. And then over the weeks, you might go, right, we're going to build to more 50%. So I just want you to work a little bit harder. So they're just very cue points. But that's the only way, really, in terms of the pails and rails format, is that you can just say, right, we're going to go at 25%, 50%, or, or whatever. So that's the only way you can, you can basically do it in an easy nutshell, really. That makes do, you sense. Think, do you think that sort of static stretching is programmed for people too much? In the sense that, like, personally, I think it, it has its place. It's okay. But it's never going to fix anyone, and it's like that's, that's it feels nice, but it's like yeah. a sports massage. It feels nice for a half an hour afterwards, but it's not going to fix the problem. Exactly, flexibility is very much a short-term thing, and I suppose in in the grand scheme of it, for mobility being in control of every element of your movement, is that flexibility is somewhat halfway there. Yes, you can. I think people. I mean, I suppose then if you go difference between flexibility and mobility, people think if I just get the band, I wrap it around there and I'm just going to yank my arm back on, mobilizing the shoulder. Oh, this is great. This is sore, but it's actually really good. Or you've got people that just kind of lead on their, on a ball and they extend, flex, then they flex their spine. Yeah, I'm mobilizing. I'm, you know, run a ball around the bottom of my foot. I'm mobilizing. It's, there, there is an element of stretching, but if you do not control that ranges of movement, I feel like you're, you're not giving yourself full credit of what you could do. You can have a yoga teacher at the very front, you know, they put their head through or legs over the shoulders, but how functional is that in your day-to-day -day life? Mm -hmm. If I've got a bus coming at me, I'm not going to put Lululemons on to have a stretch, sip my tea and then go, right now I'm ready. I need to get the head out of the way. So I need to make sure that I'm, flexibility is great, but we must make sure we can own own your range. Oh, yeah. oh nice, yeah. nice, yeah. nice. <laughs> but also, like, I think in the difference from what Jack was saying there as well is that, like, you know, when you go into static range or static stretching, it's just you know, you're doing your hip flexor, you're stretching your hip flexor, and then you come out, your hip flexor is a bit more flexible. But that's the end of that. And then it seems more that what you're doing is you're getting the hip flexor stretch. And let's say I'm just using that as an example, but also by yeah. doing it under the control that you use and on your range, you're also contracting the opposite muscle group. So you're forcing the body to create new range, but also get stronger at that range by the contraction of the opposite muscle. So like you said, with the arm lifting up, if you can get them to start working harder and get up, they're pulling their arm up. The muscles that are weak and tired are the ones pulling it back. So eventually over time, you're lengthening out the pecs and the lats, but you're strengthening up the shoulder stabilizers, the traps and all that sort of stuff. So it's like a two and one almost of stretching and activation. Exactly that. I mean, the, the course I've done over the years was just that, you know, it, people just spend all 10 seconds stretch and then they go, actually, we need to create some sort of adaptation initially through the stretch of holding anywhere between one to two minutes of which yeah. then we 
to, we try to increase. So you, you may be able to take your arm, you know, again, using the shoulder, but you might be able to take the arm up to a certain point. But as you start to relax, your body goes, oh yeah, okay, it's fine. And then you get a little bit further into the stretch. And that's where you can just try to relax. And that's the time that you can do the work. Like I said, you can only bullshit your central nervous system. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You can only lie to your central nervous system like two or three times. So it's not like you can do 20 repetitions and all of a sudden you can try and stick your thumb and touch your lower back all the way around. It's just not going to work like that. But I suppose I also as well, I, again, veering off a little bit, but if people say, oh, I haven't got 20, 30 minutes to do the work, that's absolutely fine. I mean, that's the sort of stuff I put out anyway, but it's also trying to work uh, you know, a couple of minutes at a time. Once you've done that, move on for the rest of your day. Choose another point you can do this two to three minutes worth of work. Do it again. If you can try and accumulate 10, 15, 20 minutes of work over your day, then you yeah. can sit down free potentially if that's what you want to do sit down guilt-free in the evening and watch whatever you want to watch but it's just long, it's, it, it's a mindset it's very much a mindset cool um on that sam like with um some of the going back to the rugby guys again um i just wanted to um what guy where were the most restrictions there because obviously the day-to-day i get why people's hips and stuff um but it obviously it must differ between position to position right who did you deal with the most yes. um uh, uh, rugby with regards to the mobility stuff I should say Not uh, the strength. yeah I, I, that, that, there was 44 players I dealt with every all of them oh, um, all of them okay. not necessarily okay. yeah I'd have the forwards in one session I'd have them the backs in the other session and like you said yeah uh, it, they're all, they all have different restrictions the backs are going to be a little bit more flexible um, uh, whereas the forwards are just you know flipping it I was talking about that analogy of running into the wall for 16 minutes if they do it every week for crying out loud like they are <laughs> Some of their hips and lower backs are, are stiff, but they're very much stiff for the purpose of their sport. You know, as yeah. soon as they do more sport, they get more rubbish at human. It's basically yeah. what happens. <laughs> yeah. by, the time, by the time they get to the end of their career, they're like, oh, shit, my body's really hurting here. You know, I know David Flatman, for example, it, you would do a back squat. You'd put the bar on to back squat. You'd probably get your hands for about here. He has no choice. His, his narrow grip is the inside of the collar. That's his narrow oh, really? grip. So it's, people, it's, it's, I don't know, I think, like I said at the very start, you have people that are, um, they had the ability when they were younger. I think if people were to continue that throughout their life, and then even into a sport, totally appreciate sport is going to create injuries, but if you can try to maintain, if you were to have a, um, an ACL tear or something, because of your ranges of movement that you would have do, it, I'm, I'm just spitting out rubbish here, but instead of a grade three tear, complete rupture, you might have a grade one. So therefore recovery from that might be a little bit quicker. Again, just as an, as an example, but just being ready for whatever happens, but sorry, divert George, but um, yeah, more hips and, again, hips and lower back for these guys as well is, uh, is pretty hard. Like Tom Dunn, for example, he's great on one leg because he plays hooker. His one leg, he can sweep all the way through because that's his swiping leg. His other one, you can't even put in the middle. His yeah. one hip, he can, tire but the other one you can't you can't do anything so he's very which much like you, which like you said would lead to kind of stiffness maybe some pain but actually for the purpose that he's requires to be a hooker that leg needs to be stiff the standing leg so he can stabilize while he's in the scrum while the other leg exactly. has to move around and pull the ball back yeah so mm. you're right the exactly, more you're, you're, sport. Uh, exactly like max Mah- max lahi for example has no neck he is literally yeah, like, so when he turns and, and talks to you like this it's like yes mate what, what can i do for you and, uh, but he needs that because he needs to i think he plays um prop i think but he needs that so he can tuck his head underneath and he's got a lot of weight to deal with so yeah again very fit for purpose if i was to say do this to him he'd probably just shake his head left and right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Uh, but we jack, were saying i think about, we're... jack you've got about a minute mate got a meeting. i've got a shoot sam great to see you mate. we should go uh, okay mate longer we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get uh, definitely get one again cheers, jack. jack bye jack but jack i've got you in here mate we've got you in here go on go on sorry go no on. i was just going to say because we we do a lot of stuff on like we were reading Stuart mcgill who does a lot of lower back health and so on but i remember listening to the Isler podcast that he was on and somebody was trying to talk to him about the stiffness and the hamstrings of an nba player and um he was like nah i know it's all right and they were like, well, yeah, but he's not got the flexibility of all our guys. And they're like, yeah, but have you seen him jump? Like, have you seen him jump? Have you seen how high he can do? And he's like, that stiffness in his hamstrings are there for the specific sport that he plays. And they react well. It doesn't mean it's right. It just is very specific to his position. So like your rugby players and all, they're all adapted in this very specific way. It doesn't mean longevity-wise it's going to work. But right there and then, it serves the purpose. 
Is that I think it? the thing is as well, you think nowadays they've got the benefit of all the, you know, of all this, of the modern day fitness world where there's so much out there that can help them later on. Yeah. And what you'd hope for, you know, particularly the best players that they would have accumulated enough money in their career to then, you know, be able to hopefully sort themselves out to some to some description anyway after their career is over. And that's not just talking rugby players, that's talking kind of all. I mean, how many clients have we all seen um, who maybe used to have been gymnasts all got back problems? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Their, their sport has been great for them, has made them strong and, and everything, but it was specific to their sports. So they end up with, um, with various problems. Yep. So hopefully at the end yeah. of it, we stuff like you, Sam's doing and, and we're yeah. doing, hopefully can help these people out. I suppose I, like the stuff I want to try and do, like you said, people are doing various but sports specific stuff, but all I'm trying to do is just have this like ability to just keep, I don't know, a base of some sort running through that when they do start to come out of what they need to do, they have something. Whereas yeah. many people just go, they're very much sport specific, which just is the way it is. You know, people are getting paid stupid money for it, that they just do it because that's what happens. But what they don't realize is they, they need something to come out of. And I think by the time they realize that, especially when you're 18 years old, low 20, early 20s, you know, rugby players, for example, girls money, I can smash it up, I'm absolutely hard as hell. And then kind of towards the end of their career, 30, 35, they're like, oh crap, mm-hmm. um, everything hurts. So yeah, I mean, that, that's my mentality. They could all actually tell me to get lost, but... You know, I speak to some of the players already now, which they find quite, they find it quite intriguing. And one of them wants to do stuff when the lockdown's over. So it's so working for someone. Do you know, do you know what, just uh, going off topic a little bit, um, what are they doing for training? Do you know anything about that? Do you know if they're doing any training at all? Uh, I've no idea. Yeah, I, I assume so. It wouldn't surprise me if the, the strength and conditioning guys are giving them stuff to do when they're at home. I know some of the guys have gyms, um, but yeah, they, ha- they have to. Like it, this is their job. They have yeah. to do it. I think I would be surprised if they don't get fines coming back if they don't have a reserve of requirements coming back. Yeah, come back fat or something. Well, unless you're a fat, yeah. I guess that's not. Yeah. And I I have heard stories of people getting fines because they have come back overweight for their position. What from after off season and stuff? Yeah, no, yeah really. Yeah. So they're, yeah. so they're quite strict about that. That's good. I, I mean, that's that, good, right? Mm-hmm. I suppose like any sport though, they've got like ranges, don't they? Like, you know, for your position, you want to be about between this and this weight. That's ideal for the requirements that we need you for. And then if they go way Mm -hmm. above that, you're like, you're useless now. We need to wait until you get back down because you're not going to be as quick. You're not going to be as powerful or whatever it is. Yeah, it makes sense. If you've got a player that's 120 kilos and they've got, they've failed, fallen ill for whatever reason over a six week period and they've lost 10, 15 kilos, that's a hell of a lot of weight lost. In that in that pack so yeah then they've got to do their best trying to get back as best they can mm. i'm going into uh, just going off of uh, to a different subject slightly sam we, we you and i have um you know in, in privately talked about um people's squats i mean there's something that we've talked about in the past and how people struggle to get the depth and spots you briefly mentioned it with um with your mates missus's ankle mobility um mm. what um how often what do you do to deal with with that with with your clients so what sort of kind of protocol do you take if someone's struggling with their range of movement um, in a squat and they want to improve uh, it what's your kind of thing that you do um, that? Uh, I suppose it can be different to each individual depending on what it is their training age depending on what it is they want to get out of it but if we just keep things simple and say right they want to back squat and now I want to put a bar on my back and I say okay well show me a, a body weight squat what do you have and there's so much forward leaning from the hip because they don't have enough dorsiflexion in their ankle then like, but they still want to squat i'm like okay cool what we'll do is we'll do a box squat of some sort they're still able to keep their feet nice and flat they're still ready to get down to that point and they'll still be able to get up i'm obviously not going to load the bar enough that they get down to the bottom of that uh, that squ- bottom squat and then <laughs> box and go sam help the weight's too much I'm like, hey, yeah. <laughs> you chose the weight you stay yeah. there you get your ass back up i'm yeah, clearly cam- not going to do get that get the camera out get the camera out uh, yeah. exactly Come on. Come they on. end up doing like yeah. some sort of good morning or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Face yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How often do you see it? Um, I'm, but I mean, I, I mean, at the very start, if we notice that, then I, I can, I mean, I could superset. Okay? You can be very creative. And this is why I said about the mobility side of things. You can do it at the start. You can do it in the middle. You can create one of the mobility sessions as part of an exercise. You can do it at the very end. But at the very start, if we realize we haven't got a lot of dorsal ankle flexion, 
I will give them a little bit of homework to do, but I'll make it sure it's very manageable, that they can do it. It's very simple and easy, but at the very start, we might just do some you know, half kneeling positions and just get the, your knee over the tracking over towards your toe, put a weight on top of the knee. We might just do some contraction, relaxation type movements just as a, as a pre-starter. But I suppose, you know, I'm not going to create massive um, changes in a session or two. It's going to take months and months and months, and many people are going to differ in terms yeah. of how they progress. Even, you know, even they might be structurally um, in that position for the rest of their life, they may not be actually be able to do it. You could do it yeah. for the rest of your life and no changes will happen. So fine. I mean, it does. They can still squat. They they don't have to get hips below parallel and then stand yeah. all the way back up. I can do that, but that's because I can do it and I want to do it and I have the freedom to do it. But just because I'm going to change the word now, John doesn't do it. Well, Doris, <laughs> not Doris. <laughs> yeah, um, just because they can't do it doesn't mean they can they can't not ever squat again in their life. Yeah. But again, yeah, and it it depends on their purpose. The yeah, exactly. If they want to do a CrossFit competition, the standards are hip crease below the knee. If you can't get there, and can't you want, to, and you want to have an injury, then load the shit out of that bar and get yourself in a position <laughs> you can't do because there's yeah. no way you're going to get out unless it's on a yeah. stretcher. So yeah, yeah. You know what? Do you know what's interesting there is we talked about squats there like a couple of weeks back again, and we were trying to say like. Um, what do you notice about somebody's squat? What's the most common thing? And and you even said it there now. And I, I feel it. it's the most common thing is tight calves. Tight calves always ends up with a bad squat. Like, and a lot of people were you know, stretch the hip flexors out and do all these things to be able to sit down. But if you can't push your knees forward in a squat, the only thing that your hips could do is sit backwards. And then that means mm-hmm. you're going to end up in that really heavy forward lean position and with not much depth in your hips at all. So would you agree with that as well? Ankles are seem to be the most important. They can be as well, but I suppose that it depends on what a joint is doing. Like you might have yeah. really good flexion in the ankle, but you, you might have such hip socket joints so deep that actually when you come to squat, there's actually yeah. the anterior of your hip is actually going to hit. So therefore you're going to, you're going to cause a little pain. And then that's what we call a closing angle pain. And all yeah. you're going to do is you're just going to hit bone on bone. You're going to create irritation. So people, people, I mean, yes, I agree with you on, on what I yeah. said about ankles. There has to, have, there has to be that, but they might not have great hips. They might not have the yeah. capability of being able to have good thoracic movement and keeping their torso upright. So, yeah. this is what you're trying to do is you, you you're trying to not you, you're trying to fix the parts. Yeah, you 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 have the complicated squat movement. You're like, okay, what's going on here? That yeah. person shifting to the left when they go yeah. down and up. Is that because they have an imbalance in their in their single leg or something? So all you're trying to do is you, you pull it back out. You say, yeah. okay, well, I need to work on this area. Because if whatever area you work on, I suppose you're then going to, you're going to create some difference in another area. Some shift, yeah, yeah, some shift. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're, 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 just, you're just pushing on these different movements. Of, okay, well, let's try and move that. Let's try and move that. Mm. Do the complicated movement. That's not working right. Okay, well, let's test. Go back in, retest. Still not working right. You know, and that's... Yeah, you know, I like that. that. The thing I'd say with the ankle, Simon, and Simon, Simon diagnosed my ankle tightness a few years back when we were both still at Team Breakthrough. And at that time, I, d- I decided we, I did do some um, work on it that helped. And then when I got my lifting shoes, I just got really lazy with it all. Um, but going back to what you said about the thoracic um, capabilities, whether they can get themselves back. I found that not just with myself, but with a lot of my clients who I've worked on their ankle mobility, the minute they can get their knees just a little bit forward, further forward, that back position just becomes that whole mm. lot easier yeah. because they're not having to work right. so hard to, yeah. to pull back. And another um, thing to go with that is totally on the opposite scale. If someone can't, we t- you talked about it with your, with your rugby fellow, um, if someone can't get their arms back here and they have to squat here, they're already in a position where you know, they're not going to back squat very well. They're, they're going to struggle to get that back position. So, yeah, I think um, the, the two biggest changes I've seen is getting someone's mid-back really, really strong um, and yeah. shoulder mobility. And the ankle mobility is always – I've always seen a more profound effect with my clients than with, than with hip, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I'd also – Well, dominantly, I always find, anyway. like, from what Sam said as well, um, he was talking about his friend's wife there – women seem to struggle with the mobility and the depth of the squat more i find just because of their footwear choice because they're spending all their time up in their toes because they're constantly tight on the calves that they often do that that hip squat where they just sit back and forward sit back there's not very much knee flexion going on there but the Um, the body the body's very good at shutting ranges of movement down if you do not use 
movement. You know, cells get thrown around, collagen just gets plastered on each other, and then what happens yeah. is when you try to use it, nothing really happens. So, yeah. like I said about my wife, you know, being in hills, yeah, everything from gastrocnemius and all that's going to be completely shortened. So when you go to use your range of movement, it's not there. So it's yeah. you know that that's why we try to well, that's what I try to tell people to do every day. Anyway, yeah. it's just it's just it's just little and often. Yeah, to try tell to. Nicole, if, just, if that's what they want. Yeah, just going on there. Um, do you have any? Is there any like specific moves, or is there any or your go-to moves that you would use to free up somebody's thoracic spine, so the upper portion of their back here? Is there any mm-hmm. moves that you're like, that's the one that I use either stretching, uh, soft tissue release, or strengthening exercises that you use? Um, I suppose there's, there's, there's three things. One, I would do, like, you can get a ball and you can try to relax the muscles in and around that area, maybe. Yeah. Like, one thing you could do, so like a, a small, of a, if I use a ball, for example, and I'm rolling around either side of my spine and I find some really soft, of uncomfortable areas, I want my client to be in a position where they can apply pressure. And I say to them, try and be in about a seven, a six or a seven out of 10 effort of you pushing down, not, not pain, but just like slightly uncomfortable so that you're not yeah. tensed up so then the muscle can allow you to relax and what i'll do is i'll get them to do that around the area um yeah. a bit, what was the other bit i was going to do what was your question again about thoracic it was about is there any exercises or um releases ah, yeah, that, that you go to yes so, so i'd get them to do the releases and then the, if they generally don't have very good um flexion within the spine coming around saying this is the mid part i'd get them to do what's called hinge point training so just lead on their back for example i just get them to try to focus and trying to segment their spine as best they can within this region i'll place my hand underneath their back point my little finger up and towards the area and i'll get them just try to like force and push their back down into the ground and then i'll yeah. move up a little bit, next vertebrae get them to push it down move it up again and then uh, maybe like and not necessarily into a back extension we get them to a point where they can just think about uh, or jefferson co it's like chin in towards the chest and just try yeah. to move down to little bits and back up yeah. down a little bit and back up um i've also done it as well which is quite good is I, I can wrap a band around a point. I can get them sat onto, um, sat onto a box and I'm, I create tension with the band. And what I think, get them to think about is they're up against the back of a wall and then they try to get their chin in towards their chest and they just slowly peel themselves off. And you can do that from more of a thoracic part and then you can get them going down a little bit further down and then you can go all the way down to more, more of a lumbar. So you can really kind of have a focus element on each yeah. one. But yeah, I would, I would get them to soft release. I'd get them to try and hinge point training. If they could do that at home, they could put pencil or something underneath their back and try and do it that way and then just work on you split range. Spine in three days, for example yeah exactly and just work and just work on that range as much as possible yeah and then hopefully fast if they if you say to segment you can also watch them to do it as well if you get them onto their hands and knees and you get them to try to wave their spine back and forth yeah you see that they go from the cervical part of their spine and then the, the thoracic just goes shift yeah. like that and then yeah comes yeah. up so you, you 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 can see it that way and you can also do the hinge point training on their hands and knees and just put your finger on their back as they go through and just yeah. and just try to focus on it and moving up. I mean, that's where I, I would, like it. that's where I would go with that. Yeah. So you're basically trying to get them the, they recognize what their spine does at each joint and be able to control that portion at each. Cause like you said, you get somebody to say like lift their chest up and they just, they just move their whole back. They, yeah. they, they aren't I, I, able to rock and collapse at all. Yeah, but then I've got people on the other on, on the other side is that when they do a deadlift, for example, or stand up and do it, is they look like a turtle shell. So they just stand like this and I'm, okay, stand back up, and then you know, then you have to realize you're in the middle of a class. You know, you've only got seven yeah. minutes left, and yeah. this guy is absolutely. And then you're trying to take it all, and then you've got to think on the fly, for example. So yeah, yeah. but from a one perspective, it'd be very much yeah. um, with the ball and stuff, and then working on hinge point training. But then if I'm in a class and all of a sudden you feel like someone's working like this, you just got to change the exercise. Yeah. Right? It's different elements of it. Yeah, it goes back to what you something you said a little bit earlier. That whole thoracic um, locks thoracic movement. So, something you said earlier about the you know the pushing overhead. If the thoracic is locked, which which will inadvertently mean they haven't got the range of movement in their shoulder. This is where often back injuries can come in because yeah. because of that stiffness and that extension of the lower back. Mm. So I think it's really important. So, I think again, it's another it's another area that I think. I often see a stiff with many people and if, if, yeah. if, we, if, we, if we don't get it right, yeah, yeah, you're right. And if we don't address it, or at least like you said, amend an exercise that they can, a variation of the exercise that people can do, it is likely mm-hmm. going to risk to some sort of either shoulder or, or back injury. So I think the stuff you're doing okay. is going to, we should probably go 
we should probably go through some stuff at some point, Sam, um, in a bit more. In a bit yeah, there's, there's, yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got like little things that, that people can do because I think, like you said, then about arms going above the head, we need to make sure that our joints are very inter independent of one another rather than interdependent. Hence yeah. why like, your arm comes up and then the lower back type takes all of the wrap because your shoulders can't do the, the work. So yeah, I've got little things that people can do, but you know, they're, they're not the things that are going to get me likes on Instagram, but that's the yeah. bit that's going to make a difference. In, in 40 years time so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's absolutely keep you active forever but yeah. it is it's it's so true like you see um, you see the people who are 40 plus i always find on this uh, because of their jobs because of like life is bringing them down here that when you do go to do the overhead stuff that you know they're there with their hands you like put your hands overhead mm -hmm. and they're just here and you think it's such a vital move to be able to move in full range and every time they just lean back and it. I used to see at the gym all the time, the guys would just be leaning back and they're basically doing an inclined chest press for shoulders. Yeah. 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 But then also, but also, yeah. but, but I mean also as well, depending on the purpose of the individual and what they do, you know, they, they might not need that above the head. So that's, yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah. That's absolutely yeah. fine. So if you want to start doing your incline presses, but in a safer manner rather than a standing yeah. bench <laughs> press, rather, you know, you, you just adapt on the fly. You yeah. They can still gain strength in a slightly overhead position. Yeah. Um, Sam, uh, with the Elico work that you're doing, am I right in thinking you you do talks for Elico, kind of like um, seminar sort of? Is that is that right, or am I am I mistaken there? Was I too drunk the last time yeah. we and talked about it? No, 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 no. That's <laughs> right. So it, it, I did a I did an interview in Germ I did an interview in London and went to Germany, and that was about a year and a half ago. And um, yeah, we we went to Third Space in London in Canary Wharf. You heard of Third Space? I've heard of it, yeah. It is like a hotel. It is unbelievable. <laughs> so we went there as part of our induction, basically, of one of the strength, a level one strength course for Aleco. Um, and there was a main lady there taking it. But yeah, we, we went there. And then me and my colleague, we went there for two days and we, we kind of had to learn the content and, and everything else and then take the guys through more weightlifting-esque stuff because that's predominantly what Aleco are. They are all weightlifting kit and that's what we went to go and teach along a little bit with science and programming and stuff like that behind. And then me and my colleague went to Edinburgh University to take, to teach the course. So there's, it's quite a scary thing to think. I've never been to university, didn't have the brains for it, but yeah, here's me little muggins standing up in front of these guys that are doing like, you know, sports science degrees and this, that, and the other thing. Mm. Foster syndrome kicks right in. in the other <laughs> but actually, you know, so that, you know, some of them, you know, some of them could be extremely more, maybe extremely more knowledgeable than me in terms of more science and the biology and that sort of stuff, which is absolutely fine. But from a practical aspect, yeah, and trying to get, yeah. trying to get your your yeah. clients or your class or whatever to be able to do it is that Doris don't give two dams that um, <laughs> enzymes do this, that, and the other, and you know yeah. this is your, you know this is your bicep. Like they don't care. They don't know. They don't think mm. you your glutes on the side of your cheek they're not bothered they just want this area of the body to be worked so it, yeah it was it, i do a lot of and i say a lot towards the end of the last season i went to jd gyms up north you heard of them yeah so I, JD, have I haven't heard of jd no so they are so jd's it's jd sports but it's a separate oh company, i see okay them sort of people but it's very much a separate company but i went up there and new pts that came on to new openings of these gyms uh, they had a few Aleco kits and I went up there to teach them weightlifting because they were, some of them were going to teach more CrossFit-esque type uh, work. So that was quite, again, another sort of imposter syndrome. I was thinking, these guys are going to know just as much as me. What the hell am I doing here? But again, from a practical aspect, some people, yeah. what I was teaching them, they thought was very technical and very like, oh, yeah. my God, no, because pe people in their PT courses are let loose to the general population. Yeah. I think we can all probably like to say now is that Compared to what you know now, compared to what you know then, it's Mad. two different. We two should never, apart. we should never have been let out. We should yeah. never have been let out at that point. And I'm not even joking about that. When we finished yeah. the PT course, I was not. I mean, fortunately, I was at Team Breakthrough, and I was under this kind of, um, you know, shelter of, of Breakthrough, and I had people teaching me from, you know, initially writing the programs and teaching the program to me, getting me to deliver them. So I was a bit. But you imagine how many people went from the PT course feeling like I felt like I have no idea here and I'm getting let loose yeah. from Doris and yeah. or Doris is probably going to get injured by me. So yeah, I think you're, you're totally right there. You know? But there's like so many things like Sam was saying there, like you're going to teach all these university students who, you know, have this like textbook knowledge of stuff, but just no practical experience. And, and that's what you gain through years of training people. So like you might not have 
the ins and outs of the enzymes and how the cells work and all that, but they couldn't teach somebody how to deadlift to save their life. And you've got all the, the tools in the box because you've taught so many times. And that's something that is worth its weight in gold, you know, because you probably teach a deadlift to somebody a hundred different ways, depending on how they receive that information and what you have to do. But somebody who sat in a classroom just has no idea about that. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then, you know, the people that are in the classroom, like if they've been taught, if they've been, if they've re read how to teach somebody how to do a deadlift and they go, Oh no, that's not my bullet point. Or, oh no, I've got no, you know, it's, and, and many people, they deal, they, uh, many people you can learn and cue words are different. Like I might yeah. say something to you, George, it might work for you, but it might not work for you. So, and then people work on a visual, ba a visual basis. Some people work on a verbal, yeah. basis. some people like to be shown and then they can just do it. So, it's very, very, yeah, they don't teach you that. Yeah, but uh, the personal training world, like we're going back, just going back there quickly, George, but I did a class with, I reckon, 32 people. I did it in Trowbridge, Premier, when they used to have the Premier at the end of the trade in the state. But um, I reckon, I reckon five are still PT in now, or they to 30 then. Most of them went straight out, went into the classic David Lloyd's, the fitness first and all that. And the people that thought they were unbelievable just went straight mm -hmm. into PT. And we know actual knowledge about how anything works. So like we said, you come out of there and I had more questions than I, I had more questions coming out of there than I did going in because I had more knowledge, but only a fraction of it. And these guys were just like, yeah, I'm a baller. I'm just going to go straight PT in now. And they lasted about two months and then they realized that ah right okay so i i actually know nothing now and this guy's got a <laughs> knee injury and i don't even know what that is we'll just train up our body <laughs> yeah but also as well like for us lot you know the further you go down the further you got the years behind you then you start realizing even though we know quite a fair bit you still realize i don't know nothing nothing yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah constantly think that's like why do i know nothing you know yeah. Yeah. you ever read you a see, snippet of information from somebody and you're like how the hell yeah. like what are you doing yeah. how did you know that yeah. Uh, do you know what the funny thing is? Is they all say the same thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? All those those dudes, the one that know loads, they're like, well, I still don't really know that much. Like, but you know all of it. Yeah. And I know. And I know. It's but, the yeah, day but... that you do say that you know it all is when you know nothing at all. I think because yeah. especially in our, our industry, it's forever evolving and information is getting better and better all the time. And to be adaptive to that is the only way to stay in this sort of business, I think, and to be open-minded. Like I've, I've said tons of things, no carbs. You, know, you can't eat carbs, it makes you fat. And then, oh, nuts are good for fat loss. And then I had 500 grams a day and nothing ever happened. And then, do you know what I mean? There's all these things, but I was always happy to be like, do you know what? That's what I did used to think. And the foods are good, but not in the quantities. And it's okay to be wrong as long as you're willing to move forward and say like, this is where we're going. We're getting better with the information. I'm just learning what yeah. I learned, you know? That is that. So with the Alicos, do you only do, do you only deliver the content that they, they want you to deliver or do you ever do your, your own stuff yeah. for them? Uh, yes, the content that they deliver. I went to Sweden in mm, 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 January, I think it was, uh, for three days and we were part of the developing of the uh, strength course that we were doing. And we're actually going to start pump out over time, fingers crossed, a level one weightlift and a level two weightlifting. And then we're going to be doing more functional fitness side of things. So we have been very much initially the first course I took taught up in Edinburgh University was very much this is how it's going to be done. We did have a bit of say in terms of how we change it because we were teaching in one um, in one room and we wanted to do a practical in the other room. So we had kind of like just a few slides here and there. But going to Sweden, we were very much having our own input and there was about fifth fifth less than 15 of us that were doing it and then we were like actually we'll, we think that, that this would be better that way and it the way that we would say it in the uk might be very much different in how it would be said in denmark so we were kind of like uh, we were all kind of just chucking our own ideas in there so yeah an element of both an element of both so we could be very much in the next five years we'd be advanced or special trainers or whatever so that let's say for example you guys wanted to come on board and kind of help teach all that sort of stuff we could be in a position where you know we've done it all we, we're learning the content we understand how it works we've taught up and down the country um you know and then we can kind of bring in new people and then yeah. try to help and it might even change and evolve again but it's very much in its early stages of everything that's going on and new information might come in it'd be delivered slightly different we would do it and then we might feel to the guys in america because that's the guys who are head of the laco education of like well we thought this would work but actually it didn't work except you know so yes there is an element of both sorry 
they're off. They've got your own saying it there, yeah. Um, cool. Um, so um, I think that's all, well, that's all we've got time for today, unless you've got any questions, Simon, for, for Sam or Sam. Wow, well, I just, I just want to know, like, how do you put yourself through the workouts all the time? Like, because I know you said there's days you ease off and there's days where you go, but CrossFit's just terrible for, like, you know, it's hard, <laughs> hard work. And I'm sure there's a lot of times in workouts where you sit there and there's that voice in your head just being like, this is too much. So, I mean, there's too much. Yeah. But, like, what do you do? Do you push through that sort of stuff? Like, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm honest, I, like I said to you, uh, like I said earlier to, uh, is it Jack, isn't it? Like yeah. I said to Jack earlier. You know, if people want to come in and get slammed, they get slammed. If there's 50 warbles that I've got to do, I don't really want to hold on to 50 warbles. If at some point I think it's tough, even though I want the workout, it, it depends. It depends on what dose response I'm looking for from the workout. But if I've got 50 to do, I'm not going to hold on for 50 repetitions and put myself into a hole. As soon as it starts to get a little bit tough, stop. Yeah. Take a time, go back in. But again, it's supposed on, it depends on what I want from, from doing that. the work. Yeah. Do you know I yeah, noticed well, that? Like yeah, yeah. I noticed that once from the competitions. I, I watched that like there was um the commentators were saying one what strategy they were they had like a hundred pull-ups, it was like a hundred, hundred, hundred on whatever, it was like wall balls and all that sort of stuff. But they had a hundred kipping pull-ups and everybody seemed to have a strategy. So do you is that what mm. people do? So when they start to burrow out, they, they stop themselves completely crashing and fatiguing, so that muscle can't recover, they just stop before move on or give themselves a short rest and then get back in and conserve just that little bit each time it, it, and, it and it depends and it really depends on the ability of the individual for example you stick to the pull-up um you know if there's a hundred to do what you're not going to do is try and do one max effort and you get yeah. to 30 because you do a max effort and that's all of you got all you've yeah. got and yeah. you get to they're going to be breaking down into singles pretty damn quick so yeah. you might down it it, it, at first it will feel extremely easy you might do it into five or tens or something like that just whatever you can do and you might move every 20 30 seconds you, people start you know it goes down to that all you're trying to do yeah. is it's not how you start it's very much how you finish yeah right so, okay you know and you assume, if you, you you'll have plan a that might be right i'm going to do 10 rep i'm going to do 10 um pull-ups uh, you know say crossfit and stuff you know 10 kipping pull-ups every 20 seconds all of a sudden that's plan a and you think oh shit my god my arm's starting to go here. Right, you've got to change. Right, you've got to go to plan B. And then all of a sudden, you'll keep going down until plan Z, and that's still not enough. But yeah. I, I digress a little bit. But you're, once you start doing all these sort of exercises, you have a bit of an idea of what you can do as an individual. Yeah. Just because somebody else is going to do five straight out doesn't mean that you have to do 25 straight out because that person may, might be quite easy for them, and they're going to finish, whereas you're going to be capped at whatever time, and you have to pass the first exercise, and there's three to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sam, so from, from the perspective of, a, I mean, I remember when you, you competed loads and you would train a lot. For the people who, who get to the really high level, and I'm holding my missus's makeup thing in my hand, sorry. For that. <laughs> <laughs> and for the people who get to the really like high level, how much more are they doing? Are they doing a lot more? Is it, you know, is it hard to know? Is because it is, it is, I suppose for me, it's very hard to know. I've never got to that high of a level um and so for in terms of a training aspect I, i'm sure it can be very much individualized but you, you have to realize that some of these people that it's it's this is literally their job that's what sponsors pay them to do yeah. on a daily basis right, to okay. then go and do this and the other but from a personal aspect to, tr to compete at such a high level let's say call it the games i mean i i wouldn't know from personal experience but you can imagine like i said they're going to be getting three or four sessions in a day which doesn't mean they're going to do three hammering sessions a day. Yeah. Or, for example, if it's three sessions a day, they're, they're all going to be, it's all going to be very much strategized and, uh, you know, and then it's a, it's, a, it's a phase of training backdating from when the games are going to be and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it, and I'm sure it can differ for everybody. Mm. Cool. Um, well, thank you very much, Sam and Simon. Um, Pleasure. Pleasure. Just before, before we all go, um, um, I just forgot to ask you this. I've asked everyone. Um, are, you, are you training? while while in lockdown have you been doing any training uh yes i have this year has been a very much an emotional roller coaster and it's i'm trying to do the best i can really uh i've got a bar i've got plates um i've got a rower and i've got a band so yes very much just trying to keep going as much as possible sometimes if i don't want to think the classes that we put on the guy that does the programming for the classes like i said we will have like little areas of what we do in the, in the company um, I'll just jump in on them. And it's actually quite nice, like we're doing now, get to see other people, get to hear them panting and puffing, and yeah. that can be quite nice. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm not doing any, I'm not training for anything. I'm just ticking over. So ticking over, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'll yeah, tell you I, something. I'm, I'm, there's no gains going to be made. <laughs> no, my no. perspective, I, I reckon I've got smaller, man, and then I'm already small, yeah. so, you know, so, um, I'll tell you something, though. I've, I've been doing, um, as you know, as you mentioned earlier, I've been doing the uh, my kettlebell workouts and uh, my banded workouts, and the kettlebell workouts are pretty intense. They run for only 20 minutes. And I, I get to, like, four minutes in, five minutes in, and I'm there thinking, how do people do this for an hour? Do you know what I mean? I'm like four minutes in dying. So like yeah. I, was, I was there thinking, oh, I'll just do a 20 minute workout for everyone. I'm literally dead by the end of it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'm literally dead. And the banded workout I did today, I had to do like what I was, we were doing one and a half um, reps on a split squat. Um, and like, you know, if you do it on your own, obviously I'm filming it live on YouTube for people yeah. to follow. <laughs> And like when you're doing stuff like that yourself, you sometimes you stop to take a breath. And I was thinking, in my head, I'm like, shit, I can't stop, and I'm and I'm they're dying. Watching me. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're watching me. I mean, fortunately enough, only one person was watching, but um, I was I was dying. So like, I think even if I, for personally, even if I didn't have any training, it wasn't doing my own training, that would be it. That would have been all this stuff I'm doing is more than enough. Do you know what I mean? It's, mm. it's and it, we, we have to realize is that we have to realize i suppose it's like the stresses and the strains of what's going on it's a mental side of, of things you know we we might better do what we did on a daily basis and you know running around but i think the, the thought of getting up at six o'clock in the morning now going to the gym and then training in the morning and then might train in the afternoon and this I'm, I'm exhausted just thinking about it yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i think i think our bodies have slightly adjusted to what's going on at the moment but yeah it's mm. like I said, it's very much a I'm just ticking over because if I literally didn't do nothing in this isolation, I'd be the shape of a biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, what about you, mate? How's it going? How's the, um, it's all right. It's all right. How's the, um, the, I've uh... got, I've got one. Well, I'm going to stop pretty much. Cause what I'm doing, Sam is I'm just cutting down. I'm just getting leaner. Cause I was a bit fatter earlier this year and I was supposed to be in Australia on Wednesday. It's my 30th oh, on wow. Saturday. So I was going to be skydiving. So I thought I'll just get, I'll just get cut for that. So obviously changed, plans changed and I just stayed with it. But I've got one week left. I, st I stop on Saturday. Um, I'm still training six times a week, but I've got a, gar a gym in my garage. Six times a week, I'm doing 20,000 steps a day for the last two weeks. Man, that is hard. It's not even hard as in like physically. It's just four hours of walking a day. You know what I mean? That's a lot of movement and there's a lot of that happening in my garden, which isn't very long. Like, yeah. So it's just trying to get that and... Saturday, I'm going to go all out and eat the entirety of the world. And I mean everything. And then when it comes back in the next weekend, I'm going to start trying to do the reverse diet, which is just bring my calories back up without gaining too much fat and just see where my set point is. I saw, you took, your weight, I saw you took your weight this morning. Good. What was your weight? 12.7 this morning, man. I started off at, um, <laughs> I think it was about 13.4. So half, half stone and then some like. But that's yeah, over yeah. quite a that's over quite a long period of time. It's over like like twelve weeks or something like that. I've lost you know, eight nine pounds or something. But that's but probably no, nah, exactly. That's what yeah, I wanted want to, to yeah. do. Yeah, so. uh, but it's been alright. Are you ready to? Are you ready to like not be cutting now? I'm ready to eat everything. Do you know what? I look <laughs> at Instagram, man, because like I do Instagram over Facebook, and all I see is people baking stuff. They're making all the things that I want to be eating like all day, and yeah. I just can't wait for that. But again because I've counted calories for this whole time things that have shocked me like cupcakes and all that 400 calories for a cupcake <laughs> or I could have like a chicken salad for 400 calories you're like holy shit you know what I mean there's such a disparity on there and the cupcake is gone in two seconds and we all know it doesn't end with one cupcake like no it doesn't you know it's not one or two biscuits it's, it's, it's a packet <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is literally, literally. That is literally. So I play these. I play these games where I just eat salad and meat all day, and then I just eat biscuits and crisps at night time. And then sometimes I go overboard, which means the next day I got to start myself in the evening time, and then I'm back <laughs> on the normal time. And I'm just playing this yo-yo game all yeah. the time. But as long as right. that number at the end of the week, as long as that number at the end of the week, yeah, the number you want. Everyone in the middle, can't you? No, honestly, man, it does. It does quite a lot. Like it, it and I've followed that sort of pattern for a long time, but. You know, some days are good and some days you just have to starve yourself. Yeah. Are you um are you reverse walk dieting? Yeah, oh man, I'm reversing that walk fast. There's no yeah, reverse yeah. walking. <laughs> I'm not going down by a thousand steps. I'm just coming about <laughs> eight thousand a day out. It's like I'm doing an I'm doing an hour in the morning and then I'm doing an hour in the evening and then Georgie will come in and I'm like, Georgie, I've got eight thousand steps left to do, so I'll catch you later. 
and I yeah. have to go walking around. I walked four, like I did a, I don't know, and fifteen thousand step walk the other day, and then I got I got nearly home and I had three thousand left. So I just walked the football pitch like forty times. Oh, it's just man, so boring. That's, that's just, that is mm. incredibly boring. Yeah. But then I could, I could run it, but I hate running even more than walking. So do a, do a Zumba put, class. Put, put, put some weight in a rucksack and then do half the amount of steps, and it might yeah. be just. A, that's um, what I might. That's what I might do for the regression. Just do ten thousand steps with we a weighted backpack or something. Yeah, loads yeah. of people are doing that at the moment, like walking around with weighted wow, with weights on their back extra work, stuff, isn't so. it? Like? Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so Sam, we'll have to. I think we'll have to get you back on. I think there's a lot of subject to cover with regards to. You know the mobility with the mobility and stability work on on a joint. So, um, if but if we happy, do it, we'll have to do a Sunday session first to actually experience it. Well, uh, we, uh, yes, well, yeah. Well, yeah. well, well, why don't we then? Yeah. So we'll get. <laughs> no. we'll, we'll do it the week before we get you back on, so it's fresh yeah. in our minds. You yeah. Know, so it's because oh, um, I know it's going to be hard because them end ranges of hip movement and where you're trying to just lift the foot off and all that sort of stuff like that. Look, it's so hard because yeah, man, that hip one looks. Body. Yeah, that hip one looks that, so well, hard. Like so hard. Have a go. I put, I, I, yeah, I put the two two up on my YouTube. Um, yeah. Things. Feel free to just have a little good, have a little look at it. I'll yeah, definitely I will. do that. I will. Um, so for everyone who's watching, um, if you want to uh, see any of Sam's stuff, um, follow Own Your Range. Is that the main one you put all your content on, Sam? Um, yeah, 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 Own Your Range. Yeah, I've got. My, yeah, Own Your Range. I've got my own personal one at Pullen at P U W L three N, not E N. So yeah, have a look. I put I just yeah. put a mix of stuff on there. Yeah, and then don't forget, guys. Simon's got his three core workouts um, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at twelve thirty live on Instagram. And um, don't forget about all my um, workouts, kettlebells, banded, and the stability work that I'm doing um, once a day, uh, Monday to Friday, all on YouTube. Okay, so we're we're all offering as much as we can to help you guys out uh, while we're in isolation. Um, so Simon, I'll see you next week. Yeah. And Sam, we'll um we'll let you know. I'll let you know when the next time yep. we have a have a slot available, and we'll, we'll yeah, get it's you definitely in. Definitely good, man. Definitely. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, I'm we'll excited. About second yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. We'll, well, we'll we'll pick a joint. I think we'll pick a joint. Maybe we'll ask the um, our devoted fans um, what what how they want to help. How, with. About, how, how about a little help hit, hit thing or whatever? But how about a little session in this one as well? How about that? Yeah. Like, an actual like, like conversation. Active. Yeah. Just like. A little, something little, yeah. Yeah, like, you absolutely. could do something yeah, like a 15, a really 20 idea. minutes or something, get us all yeah. wrecked. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So let's 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 pick a joint. Let's let's do a little bit of mobility. Let's pick the hip because that's come up more than anything else in today's um today's chat. Yeah. So let's pick the hip and the next time we get in, we'll do we'll do 15 minutes. And if you guys who are watching um want to join in, um all the better. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks very much, guys. Perfect. Um uh, stay, you, stay safe um and Pleasure. see you next time. See you later. See you later.